but we saw what mining stocks can do when the market even suspects that the Fed is done hiking. Imagine what they will do when they go back to zero overnight in some emergency announcement. And that is what is going to happen almost certainly. Well, hello there, my friends. Rafi here from The End Game Investor with this week's Silver Report for Arcadia Economics. And it looks like the Fed's final rate hiking cycle is over. I predicted that a few months ago. I was wrong about the timing, but now it seems that it is over, which is why we saw a big jump in gold and silver and especially mining stocks this week. Because people understand, people in the mainstream, the bankers understand the Fed has done hiking rates. So imagine if this was the effect when the Fed is done hiking rates. Imagine what the effect will be when they cut back down to zero. And we have some big banks that are predicting some big cuts, even in the mainstream. I believe it will be even more extreme than the most extreme predictions that are coming out of the mainstream now. The biggest is from UBS, which I think is about 200 or so basis points. But we'll get into the article specifically. And we had a downside surprise in consumer price inflation, but the embedded parts of the CPI are still very much elevated. We'll go into the owner's equivalent rent and meat, poultry, and fish, which are rising like crazy. If you've been to the supermarket, you would know that and you eat meat, poultry, or fish. I'm going to do some more triangulation on the timing, the reverse repos that I've been covering every week. Those spare dollars in the reserve tank are fast running out. We're down to $944 billion. We've broken below a trillion. We won't go above a trillion until and unless the Fed pivots one last time, which it is on its way to doing in the next few months. And I believe it is two to five months out, depending on the rate that we've seen in reverse repo drainage these past few months. But personally, I believe that once those funds hit zero, the Fed will cut back down to zero immediately and restart quantitative easing. And from there, we will see gold and silver catapult to all time highs on both gold and silver. And from there, the end game should be in sight. This week's Silver Report is brought to you by Fortuna Silver Mines, symbol FSM. You can find them at fortunasilver.com. Uh, we have, we had a big week last week, or this week, is it? In Fortuna, uh, we pushed back up to the 50-week moving average. I don't have that on this chart because I want to emphasize something else in the, in the uh, weekly moving averages were in the way. I want to illustrate that since over here, uh, February 1st, 2021, that is the date of Silver Squeeze, and that was the high on FSM at 985. Since then, we've seen lower highs uh, consistently. Lower high here, lower high here in November 2021. Another lower high here in February 2022. Another one over here. Uh, another lower high here. And it keeps going, going, going. Now, we have seen higher lows because we did hit a low here in late September of 2022 hit an intermediate low here. And from there, we've been seeing higher lows. We've well, also been seeing lower highs, and that is classic triangular action. If we can pull above this recent high at just under $4 from July 2023, then we can establish a pattern of higher highs and higher lows, which would indicate a new intermediate rally is underway. We hit a low here and what looks to be a yearly cycle low. For those of you who are into cycles, I dabble in them sometimes. You've had a low here in September 2022. Another one here, September, October 2023. That's a year. So it's a yearly cycle low. And if we're headed higher and we do confirm higher highs uh, here just below $4. So if we hit $4, yeah, we're in a new bull market for gold and silver mining stocks, which FSM is one of my favorites. Personally, that is not advice. But let's continue with this week's silver report. First thing I'm going to share here is an article from Bloomberg. UBS strategists see far deeper Fed rate cuts than what markets are pricing. Strategists predict 275 basis points of easing starting in March. Anticipate U.S. sliding into recession by second quarter. Uh, UBS is the bank that bought Credit Suisse, the dying mega bank. So it says here that the Federal Reserve will cut interest rates by 275 basis points next year, nearly four times more than what markets are pricing. Strategists at UBS Investment Bank predict. We don't see the conditions for why this time is so different. But Wedja, he's a UBS guy, said in an interview at UBS's London office, inflation is normalizing quickly. Yeah, not really. We'll get into that in a second. And by the time we get to March, the Fed will be looking at real rates, which are very high. So yeah, the Fed is led by the market. It does not lead the market. If the market is saying that there will be rate cuts, the Fed will give them rate cuts, except 
what UBS is not counting on and what no bank is counting on is a sudden and extreme financial crisis due to the reverse repos running out sometime in between February and April of next year. But we saw what mining stocks can do when the market even suspects that the Fed is done hiking. Imagine what they will do when they go back to zero overnight in some emergency announcement. And that is what is going to happen almost certainly. Now that we have UBS's forecast of almost 300 basis points, almost 3% in rate cuts for next year, uh, let's go a little bit into the CPI from this week. And we'll see that the really important parts of it are pretty stable to rising. So yes, we do have an overall fall in consumer prices, price index acceleration, like a deceleration, not falling prices, obviously. Uh, but the most important parts of it are still rising strongly. We have here meats, poultry, fish, eggs. Uh, they are rising the fastest since May 2022, 0.7% for the month. The last time they rose that fast was in May 2022, when consumer price inflation was hitting its highs across the board. So here I've pointed out what is happening on a year-over-year -year basis for October. Uh, in October 2021, we were up about 12% year-over-year from October 2020, which is around here. Uh, so that's around 6 7%. And from there, we went up 12% above the 7% that we already uh, had gone from 2019 to 2020. And then from 2022, we're up another 8% after another 12% rise in 2021. So here, it looks pretty moderate, right? 0.4%, but it's 0.4% rising above the 8% and the 12% and the 6% for the past three years. I mean, these prices just continually go up. They never, ever fall. Uh, if we go here, we can see that the most stable and the bedrock of the consumer price index, the CPI, is owner's equivalent rent. And we look at the year-over-year -year increase in owner's equivalent rent here. Owner's equivalent rent, it's not a thing that really exists, but it is uh, extrapolated by homeowners. They're called up by people at the Fed and saying, what would you rent your house for? What do you think you could get for it if you were renting it, even though you own it and you're paying a mortgage? And they give you like a shot in the dark. Uh, assumption answer based uh, on their feelings for the day. Uh, but it really follows. It's, it's it's kind of like a proxy for inflation expectations. So here we're at 6.84% year over year. And this number, even though it has come down from the peak at around 8%, just above 8, maybe 8.1, 8.2%, even though it has come down, it's come down very, very little. And it is still higher than at any time ever since owner's equivalent rate became measured in the mid-1980s. So we're still at a very, very high owner's equivalent rate inflation rate here. And how much is owner's equivalent rate part of the CPI? Well, we'll get to that in this chart. This is from the Cleveland Fed. You can find this at Sticky CPI, a part of the Atlanta Fed. They have this website uh, that shows Sticky CPI. Just stick it into Google and you'll find it. So here it shows the weighting of owner's equivalent rent for this index, which is the most stable of inflation indices. So you have OER Northeast, and OER Midwest, OER South, and OER West. And this is what they account for, relative importance, 5.3, 4.5, 7.7, 6.9. 7, so these are just points on a rubric. And we have the, 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 the total for the rubric here. Uh, total sticky price items, all of this stuff it means sticky Sticky prices mean prices that change very, very infrequently. They are very difficult to change, so they are stable. So if these are changing fast, then you know the the core. I wouldn't say the core, not technically the core, because it's not core. Core is everything except for food and energy. But the stuff in the CPI that accounts for the most and is the most stable is headed higher very, very quickly, even now. So you have total sticky price items account for 70.1 in relative importance points on this rubric. And total non-OER, we have this number for non-owner's equivalent rate. Everything besides owner's equivalent rate, that accounts for 45.7. So 45.7 of 60.1 is about 65%. So the rest, OER, accounts for 35% of the sticky CPI. So 35% of the sticky CPI is still at record highs. Uh, and here we have the sticky CPI graph here from the Atlanta Fed, Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. And we see here that we are up around 5%. I think it's 4.9 or something like that. And yes, we have gone down from a peak here about 5.6, 5.5. But still, even at this peak, we, this has not been hit even at these decelerated levels since 1990 and before that 1986, 1987, barely. So yeah, we're still at uh, highs here in what really matters, what really counts in the CPI. So once 
these deflationary pressures are let up when the Fed prints more money again, which is going to be about two, two to five months. And we'll see that in the next slide. Yeah, inflation is going to explode to the d- d- double digits and what I believe will be the triple digits and then the dollar will die. Um, this is something that Javier Blas shared on Twitter. Uh, I didn't know about this. So it's interesting to me. We have the lowest distillate fuel since 1982 seasonally. November is a time that uh, that stocks are typically top out. Um, I don't know. It's a distilling season or something. I don't know how this industry works, but saying seasonally, he says uh, that winter is mild. U.S. stocks of distillate fuel, diesel and heating oil are ending the fall season at their lowest seasonal level in data since 1982. So we're very low on uh, goods here on energy. So, uh, yeah, if the <laughs> the Fed prints money and pushes up demand, uh, aggregate demand, as the Keynesians like to call it for this stuff again, which they will at the beginning of the year, which we'll see in the next slide. Uh, we're going to run out of distillate fuel or it's going to go way, way higher, way, way faster. So as to balance, to clear the market. Um, here's why we have two to five months left. And I'm going to, uh, I've compared the daily chart with the monthly chart to give you some averages here. We are down to $944 billion in the reverse repo facility. Those dollars that are, that were printed in 2020 and 2021. And I believe those are the only sources of liquidity that is keeping asset prices inflated now. And these go down almost every day now. They're down another $44 billion yesterday. We're down below 1 trillion. And by these monthly averages, we are going to run out in somewhere between two to five months. So I took the averages starting from April, 2023, how much it's gone down every month. And I tallied these up and gave it, got the average and it was $177 billion per month. Now that's if we maintain this rate uh, since April of a monthly rate, then we'll be out of reverse repos in five months. Uh, so that's, what is it? We're in November, December, January, February, March, April. By April, we'll be out if we maintain the average rate of what we've seen since April, 2023. However, if we continue the rate that we've seen since October, which is $420 billion a month, then we only have two months left. Really, it's probably going to be somewhere in between there, between two and five months. It's not going to quite be in January. It's not really not going to be as far as April. It's somewhere between February, March, something like that. This one is going to run out and we're going to experience the next financial crisis and the Fed is going to freak out. Uh, I've shown here another metric that I've never actually looked into. I want to know how many counterparties are involved in these reverse repos, how many banks are giving extra cash to the Fed every night. And so I took some key figures here from an Excel spreadsheet that I jiggered on NewYorkFed.org. This date, uh, December 30th, 2022, was when reverse repos were at their all-time high of $2.55 trillion. That was New Year's Eve 2023. And we had 113 counterparties. The all-time low of counterparties uh, since then was 90 counterparties on uh, November 25th, 2022. And we are now at 92 counterparties. Uh, handing in $944 billion. That was the last read we had on November 15th. So my point is, if we get below 90 here, then we know that these major institutions are running out of reverse repos and less and fewer and fewer of them have any money to give back to the Fed. We haven't broken 90 yet. Once we do, it'll be another alarm. We should in the next few days to weeks. And so even though the gold and silver stocks are not performing great over the medium term, we saw what they did When the market realizes the Fed is done hiking, imagine what they will do once the Fed hikes back down to zero and buys trillions of dollars worth of bonds. The whole sector is going to explode and money is going to fly out of every other sector and head in there and into commodities and into futures. And we're going to see backwardation across the board in all commodities, even in gold and silver. And the death of dollars should not be that long after that. I don't think this is something we're going to recognize as it happens gradually, it's going to be something that we see happen overnight or within a week. The entire world is going to change and the panic into real money is going to begin and is not going to last long. So this is not something to chase, it's something to be ready for. And it will happen sometime next year, in my estimation. As always, I could be wrong. I've been wrong before, but I just can't see how they can continue this charade after the spare money runs out from 2020 and 2021. Once it does, that'll be it. They'll have to print more and we'll be in a new world. This is Rafi of the Endgame Investor with this week's Silver Report for Arcadia Economics. And I'll see you guys next week.